Well, I am excited you're here. And for everybody online, we're glad that you're joining us. Now, how many weeks have we been into, into our study? Does anybody know? Four? Yeah. So I, I think it's four or five. And, and that's me as the teacher. So I forgive each and every one of you for not knowing how many weeks of class. But every time that we start, we kind of go back over a little bit of what we talked about the week before. So there shouldn't be any surprise. The pop quizzes aren't really that exciting um, because you already know they're coming. So what did we discuss last week? Saul, his Saul, Paul, Saul, it's fun to hear you all saying that. Um, so his transformation, yeah? And the difficulty that that must have been for him, the transformation and how that could have been perceived as a threat by the political elite. We talked about his family background. Um, we discussed, you know, what that must have been like and, and some different ways that he and and Barnabas ultimately worked together, and um, the church in Antioch kind of being like uh, Jerusalem East and doing lots of good work. So that's, that's where we were last week. Um, this week we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're not going to necessarily focus on some of the characters, um, people, human beings, like we have in the past. Um, we're going to speak a little bit more tonight conceptually about some things that I think um, are important for us in our daily walk as Christians and continuing on that path from milk to meat in our spiritual growth. We'll talk about some things tonight that um, may or may not be uncomfortable for us, but I think it still be really important um, for us to dive into. So I would like to start off, now that we've kind of rehashed where we've been, I'd like to start off tonight with a question, all right? When do we see illustrations of things being divided and separated in Scripture? When do we see things, illustrations, where God in Scripture has described a separation of things? Go ahead. In the back, sheep and the goats. Tell me more, Richard. What's the deal with sheep and goats? What's the separation? Okay, but why, why, why are you bringing up sheep and goats in the separation? Okay. All right, so we had a separation between the righteous and the unrighteous, maybe? All right. I saw somebody else up here that was raising their hand for separation. Same thing? Okay. Others? What's that? Light and darkness. Yeah, I was going to... Uh, yes. Light and darkness. There's a clear separation. Yes, in the very back. Oh, are we stretching? The wheat and the chaff. Okay? There was a separation, right, between weeds and the good stuff. All right, others? Jews and Gentiles, others, the parting of the sea, yeah, there's a big separation there, let people walk through, a, a salvation story, others, I'm sorry, the Tower of Babel, what did we separate at the Tower of Babel, languages, what were the people before that separation, they were united in one cause, right? All right, so we've touched on clean and unclean. We've touched on uh, the people at the Tower of Babel. We, we touched on saved and unsaved. Um, what did Jesus say? What, were there any illustrations that Jesus gave about separation? Yes. All right, the wolf in sheep's clothing and separating the wolves from the sheep, okay? All 
All right, so Christians from non-Christians? Others. Who did Jesus come to... For? Okay, so sin separates us from God. Who did Jesus come for? Did he... Yeah, so, so we spoke about that last week, right? Division. That, that, and I'm glad you brought that up. That's part of our lesson tonight. Did, did he come for the healthy? Or did he come for the sick? So there's a separation there, right? Yes. The lost. So those people, like Chelsea and I, lost on a trail somewhere. We were found our way. Jesus came to provide salvation to those that were lost. All right, so um, the sick and the healthy, those that were lost versus those who were not. All right, um, while Christ said he would divide households, why, why did, like, what was the point behind that? Was it because his message is really that divisive? Or is it because of the change and the transformation that takes place that separates people out? While Christ came and, and spoke about the division that would, would cause, it was because people wouldn't follow him. People wouldn't follow him. Not because he necessarily desired division. It was just a statement of the facts that people weren't going to follow him. How many times have, have we ourselves thought collectively or individually about what it must have been like to walk in the footsteps where Jesus was and to be able to actually hear him teach the words that we read? Has anybody thought about that and what that must have been like? Yet, we still had all these people that, that couldn't accept the message. They rejected it. All right. Um, if we think along these, this path, okay, when Abram was called, what was he called from? I'm sorry? Her? Earth. Earth. <laughs> Thank you. So he was called from a land, right? The land of, of where he was from, okay? He had no real basis of faith in God, but he was called, and what did he have to learn? I heard somebody say something, but I don't know what it was. Faith, trust. Those are things he had to learn. He had to cultivate those things. And God did that with Abram and Sarai, and they helped God along the way, with um, a second wife. And during this time, Abraham moved throughout the land. What other illustrations do we have where God used people and moved them throughout the land to help teach them something? Okay, Moses, the Exodus. Now, I can't remember if it was a quick lesson if it was a sermon if, but recently the church just talked about this right with one of our lessons about why god used the wilderness to help the people and it was to help separate them to divide them from what they had been learning in egypt they had to go through a, a cleansing process if you will so these are some of the different illustrations of things being divided and separated. There was a purpose behind it. There was an intent behind that separation, that division. Now, if I were to think about it today, we have divided ourselves, right? We've been divided here. We've been divided here. We've been divided here. And we've been divided here by choice. Okay, how do you introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm, I'm from the left view. Okay, I've never, 
had that interface, but that could be a way that we introduce ourselves. <clears throat> I'm from the center left view, I'm from the center right view, and I'm right in the middle. Um, okay, we use our name, and typically, what do we follow that with? What we do, where we're from, right? All these things that in some ways categorize us and separate us from one another, but in other ways categorize us and align us with others. In that conversation, have you ever had that conversation where something unifies you across all of those boundaries and it's the church? You ever had those conversations? And you're like, you what? You, you knew who? You knew where? You worshiped? Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. What a small world. The unifier. Now, we separate ourselves all the time. We divide ourselves all the time. Yet Christ is the great unifier. And so tonight, the conception, the, the thoughts, the, the ideas that I want us to explore is what do we do with the way that for whatever reason, we seem to separate ourselves from one another. We may separate ourselves with our friends within the church or other churches. We may separate ourselves with statuses within the church or with, within our, our friends. We may separate ourselves through favoritism or things like that. That's where I want us to go and think because a lot of times we are set up to be divided. And at least to me, when I look out on the horizon and I look culturally, I grew up in a time where I felt very united with people. I felt like differences weren't set up the same to make me feel different than my neighbor. I was made like when I grew up, it, it, things didn't matter the same as far as the division goes. And I don't, I can't help but think that that also influences us within the body of Christ and um, that it's something that we need to be cautious of because Christ is the unifier. Christ is the unifier. So what I would like to ask you now, so, you know, I'm going to ask you lots of questions. Yes, go ahead. All right, so we have an illustration of maybe some of the things that we're comfortable with is because of what we've been exposed to in the cultures that we're exposed to. And so maybe sometimes it's uncomfortable for us to um, visit with other people or, or to interact. Um, so what I'd like to ask you tonight is why, why did... Christ, why does Christ act as a unifier? Like, what is the purpose? Like, why, why would it matter that we're unified under Christ? I'm sorry? He's unique. All right. Okay. So nobody else can do what he did, but what... Why is there a apparent need for that unification? 
I'm sorry? He prayed to that end? That we might be one? That his disciples might be one? As who is one? Okay. Yes. All right, so the illustration that was given is that in the garden, God and man existed together, and that it was sin that separated us. When we walk out the doors, if you feel isolated, and you feel isolated, and you feel like there's no way, and you feel like there's no hope, what does that do to the body of Christ? It's not, very effective. it's not very effective. Do you ever go out from these doors and feel beat down? Yes. The whole design of having us unified together as the body goes back to that unity of one and that cohesiveness. And there's great danger in constantly separating out ourselves because when we are divided and we are isolated we lose hope we fall we can feel in disarray we may feel like we're the absolute only person going through what we're going through when in fact it's a lie we may feel like nobody can understand what it is that we're enduring, which is a lie. It is not true. People have suffered through millennia of things. Time after time after time. have endured hardship. And have also enjoyed great things. Yet, we allow that separation to occur. Now, the challenge for us as individuals and sometimes selfish people is to, to not allow that to happen. It's to not allow that to happen. Who did Jesus work with? Lost the sick. I'm sorry? Lost the sick. He worked with the lost? He worked with the sick? He worked with the unclean? He worked with common people as well as... Okay. He worked with common people along with intellectual types. Who came to him in darkness? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Now... Was Nicodemus some common fisherman knucklehead? No. Was Jesus unwilling to talk to him? No. Now sometimes it feels like there is an effort to say that Jesus was only interested in the marginalized. And Jesus was only interested in the disenfranchised and the people that weren't in power. But that's not what we see evidence of. And while those people in some stories that we see were responsive, it doesn't mean that he was excluding others in that regard. I want to just say, we'll go here and then we'll come over here. Yes.
So, so if what I hear you saying is in the same boat, is people were seeking out Jesus. And the Pharisees and those types of folks weren't seeking him out. Okay, keep going. All right, so we'll do a little bit of a counterpart, counterpoint in just a moment. Yes. All right, so Richard touches on the piece around belief in God's supreme wisdom to overcome all of these things that seem to naturally uh, separate us, whether that's historical backgrounds or, or other backgrounds, economics, or etc. All right, so when we look at this and we think about the separation, there was a defined reason for that separation. As the church, what, what, are we, what is another way or another phrase historically that has been used to describe the church? I'm not sure I'm asking this the right way, but the called out. All right, so there is a, a separation that is designed there to be called out, to be different than the world or those that don't have the same hope that we have. But there's a design purpose behind it. The design purpose behind favoritism and making you feel lonely and isolated is to get you weak so that you're ineffective. And... You know, there was a, a, um, a video of, of a hunt. And the hunt was between lions and other animals out, out in Africa. And everybody's heard the illustration about what they're looking for. And what are they looking for? The weak? The isolated? The what? Okay not part of the herd and the strength being within the herd. Now, <clears throat> we can draw all types of illustrations and examples from that, but the same is true for us. Now, what happens in a herd when the herd realizes there is a weak one or a straggler that's being attacked? Do they leave it? Some people are saying yes, and some people are saying no. Okay. In, in the video I saw, they came back, and they fought off, and they tried to help the weak and the lonely and the isolated. They didn't leave them to die off. They didn't ignore them. They didn't see, oh, they're missing, who cares? Yet, some people feel that way. Some people in this body feel that way. 
Some people fell off the membership roll and were lonely and isolated and separated. And they're not here anymore. And we individually and we collectively are responsible for that. The ministry of Jesus and the disciples, they were from different backgrounds. They were from different groups. But they unified and they rallied. And when Peter failed and did what he said he wasn't going to do, what happened? Did he get kicked to the curb? What did Jesus do when he came back? What did he do? He just forgave him? What did, what happened? Peter was reconciled. And we looked at Peter's life, didn't we? Didn't we spend some time on Peter? Man, can you imagine life without that reconciliation? If he had just been left to, to dangle on his own and to be mired in his thoughts. Favoritism, separation, creates division. Isolation creates division within the body. And it goes against what we referred to earlier in John 17, verses 21 through 23, where Christ prayed for us, for unity. It weakens the bonds that should be something that holds us close together. Now, how many of you have ever heard the phrase about the blood runs thick? What is that supposed to mean? What does that mean? I mean, how is that phrase supposed to be taken? That, that there's something different there, right? And as the called out, that's what we're supposed to represent. Something different. Something unified. Something together. The division and the isolation, those types of things can manifest in cliques and feelings of exclusion and a sense of hierarchy within the body. Within the body of Christ, unity is a fundamental principle. We have one purpose, essentially. What is it? What is our one purpose, essentially? I'm sorry? To glorify God? Somebody else? Spread the word. What was one of the last things Jesus said? Okay, I'm hearing a couple of different things. One is, love one another. Okay? What did he tell the disciples? Obey my commandments, seek and save the lost. What do we call this? The Great Commission. His whole life is worthless without that in many ways. If people aren't sought out, if they aren't saved, why did he have to go to the cross? What is the point? Like, it, it doesn't necessarily matter. Okay, so it's why we're surrounded by heathens. So, <laughs> all right, so, so John brings up something that's kind of interesting, and it's actually probably more like 60 years, because the, the church of Christ probably had its greatest growth time during the 60s, which... Well, 50s and 60s, largest growing body of believers. But 
Okay? That aside, regardless of what that looks like, if we were to look in the rearview mirrors, what do we own? What part of it do we individually and collectively own? When we know people aren't here, does that bother us? When I taught and, and preached in Shepherd, Texas, did you know that every single time I sent a card to somebody and told them that I missed them, they were there the next Sunday? Every single time. Now, I don't know that that like continues all the way across, like to this congregation or whatever, but it was mind blowing to me that that one simple act, somebody would show back up that hadn't been here, had not been there. Now there's another piece that goes with that, which is if we have people that haven't been here and they come back, how do we treat them? Where have you been? What do you mean, where have I been? I haven't been here, obviously. No, I'm being serious. Like, well, why didn't you call me? Why didn't you reach out? Like, did you not care about what I was going through? Like, these are real emotions that people have. These are real feelings. These are real conversations that people have. And so when we talk about heathens, I'll come to you in just a moment. Part of it is we don't do our jobs in our houses. Part of it is we don't do our jobs in our communities. We're not the beacons. We're not the leaders. We're not the, the standard setters. We're the followers. We don't protect our own. We don't look at the herd and see folks falling off and do everything we can. And granted, in some cases that may not work because the heart is hardened or, or whatever it is at that moment. But it's not because we didn't try. All right, I told you I'd come back to you. Yeah, so, so what was brought up is the aspect of personal responsibility and what we can control is how we act and how we react and how we interact and what we own. And while we can't necessarily change people, that decision has to come from them. We can't influence people. And we can be good examples. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and we can make it a point to try to emulate what we see from Jesus. So I did warn you that some of the conversation tonight might be uncomfortable, but we are on a path of spiritual growth, right? What did Paul have to address in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1? Sorry? Unity. All right. Bickering and fighting with one another. There's a whole variety of different things, but, but Paul spent some time urging believers to be of the same mind, judgment, and avoiding divisions. 
Now, when I talk about this, I'm not talking about it because like, I'm concerned that somebody is going to hate the carpet and then we're going to have the Woodland Oaks Church of Christ 2.0 or something like that. Like the concern is about the body and how we interact with one another and how we care for one another and how we pay attention to those that may not feel like they're good. And it's easy. It's easy because we're divided and we're isolated and we go our separate ways and we do our separate things and we show up and we look good and we smile and everybody asks how we're doing and we tell them, what do we tell everybody? I'm good. You know, the truth is, it's horrible. Who wants to hear that? When you ask somebody, <laughs> we got one person that's being transparent. When we ask somebody how they're doing and they give us a negative response, is that always what you're looking for when you're actually asking somebody how they're doing? Or are you just being nice? <laughs> you go to... <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> yeah. So there's a. I'll come to you in just a moment. Oh, go. Ahead. Actually, go ahead. All right, so, so listen, the truth is, in a lot of these situations, we're not comfortable saying that something's wrong. That's the straight truth. You don't want to admit that life isn't perfect. And we can go around all over social media and see every perfect family. And we can see every perfect individual, right? Or am I just saying stupid stuff that doesn't make any sense? We have facades. We have stuff that's not real. We live in a broken world. Earlier in our class time, when I looked around the room and said, we probably every single one of our families could talk about some type of brokenness or hurt in our families, nobody disagreed. Either you were polite or it was accurate. Why be unified in a body of a family if we can't be honest? Why be unified as Christians if we can't say that this is hard and I need help? Or we can't say everything is amazing. Life is really good. God is blessing me right now and blessing everything I do right now. And I don't honestly know how to deal with it. I mean, where, where are we? I mean, I love listening to people fellowship on Wednesday nights. It is great to see people breaking bread together and interacting together all across the tables. But the truth is, We've got all these empty pews here. Not everybody's here. And we got all these other folks that live in these houses all around us and at the parks, they're not here either. So there's a unique challenge for us. We are called out. We're called to live differently, which we know from Jesus's words causes division because we live differently we act differently we interact differently but what difference does it matter what name is on this building as a unifier of christ if people see similar stuff everywhere they go and there's no difference even with us i can go home and feel isolated I can go out into the, into the waterway and feel isolated. I can feel separated any place in this world. And anymore, 
It is easier and easier and easier to make people feel that way. And for us, not only is it a unique challenge, it is a tremendous opportunity. I'll come to you in just a moment. And I appreciate it because I am always asking for audience participants, and now I'm telling you to be quiet. <laughs> so it's a dangerous thing. But the flip side of that challenge is when people walk in these doors and they see us interacting and they see the way that we take care of each other, it is different. We have that capacity. We have that ability that people want to come here because they know how they're going to be treated. They know that we're going to be unified in the way that Christ unified people. They know that whenever we ask how they're doing, we're sincere. That when we want them in Bible class, we're sincere. When we see their children going to Bible class and we're like, hey, the class is over here. They're going to love it. We're sincere. We're different. And if you've ever been to a place that gives you that feeling, you know what I'm talking about. The inclusion, the belonging, the sense of commonality, the, the purpose, the, the drive, everything centered around how different it is as a body. That's something that you won't get elsewhere. It'll be fleeting everywhere else because it doesn't have God at the center. One of the things that I absolutely appreciate about my upbringing is it was horrible. It was terrible. And I got to see people make mistake after mistake after mistake and try to fill their lives with every single vice known to man to make you happy. And it didn't work. It didn't work. And for me, this was the alternative. This was the difference maker. A life in Christ filled everything. Now, I still have a whole lot of stuff to work on. I am not perfect. And I don't want to hear any amen. So. <clears throat> but we have the secret unlock we have the secret sauce we have the magic bullet we have what everybody is trying to figure out we have the answer you have it and sometimes we forget that and we get caught up in, in these other things that we've, we've discussed tonight. And it's designed to cripple us. When Jesus sent the disciples out, why did he send them out two by two? Why did it matter? Why didn't he send them out singles? Okay, to support each other. We're here to support each other. We're not here to dunk on each other. We're not here to separate ourselves as our family is better than your family. Our heritage is better than your heritage. Our grandkids are better than your grandkids. That's not, <laughs> that's not why we're here. We, we have something special. And I hope tonight, as uncomfortable as points may have been, that it's something that we can take to heart and each learn from so that we can build this body and continue to build the body up. This is in no way like some type of condemnation of the church here. Please don't take that away. This church is a beacon of hope. People come from all over the place to be here. We have a luxury worshiping here. And we should never take that for granted. You go 500 miles north, 600 miles north, 1,000 miles north, and the church 
is like 100 people if you're lucky. The church is 10 people. The church is three people. We have a luxury here. And, and we should hold on to that and we should continue to use that luxury the way that God has designed it to strengthen each other, to encourage one another, and to reach out to the lost souls around us. Tonight, we're going to close with a prayer. And yes, oh, I did not come back. Then we'll close with a prayer. Thank you. See, I've got an amazing wife that helps me stay on track on so many things. Yes. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So there's a lot that, that you shared there, Travis, that I'm not sure that we'll be able to get to every piece of it, but there's connectivity and community. And I know several of you are leaders of organizations, and you know exactly how to build community and connectiveness and cohesion. So I think in many ways, people know what to do and how to create what you're talking about where there's some authenticity there. Would you bow with me? Father in heaven, we come before you tonight and we thank you that you've given us your word. We thank you that you have sent your son for our sins and that you created something we call the church. <coughs> Father, we, we ask that you would be with us, that we would be there for one another as you have designed Father, that we would be there for our community in ways that show who you are and offer the hope and the peace that we've already discovered. Father, I thank you for each person that is here tonight. I pray that you would be with their hearts, their minds, and their, their souls, that they can trust wholly in you and that we can be bound together and unified through you through all of our experiences. And Father, I pray that you would be with those that feel lonely and isolated and weak, that we can find the courage to reach out to them. Father, help us to never forsake you or what you've done for us. And Father, we thank you for the luxuries of this body. And we pray that we won't take that for granted either. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.